So I'm going to now um, begin by in, uh, welcoming Erin Genia. Um, Erin is an artist, educator, and community organizer specializing in indigenous arts and culture. Erin has an MS in art, culture, and technology from MIT's uh, ACT program, um, uh, a sort of slightly varied but similar version of the program that I once knew. Um, she also has an MPA in tribal governance from the Evergreen State College and studied at Institute of American Indian Arts. Um, Erin was awarded the 2019 MIT Solve Indigenous Communities Fellowship and received her first public art commission from the city of Seattle Office of Arts and Culture. Genia's work has received attention from diverse audiences and has been exhibited internationally at the Venice Biennial, the Museum of Northwest Art, and even the International Space Station, which I'd love to hear more about. Genia is a multidisciplinary Dakota artist whose practice merges cultural imperatives, pure expression, and exploration of materiality. As stated by Genia regarding one of her works, in Dakota philosophy, all things exist within a continuum of life, and the concept that we are all related extends not only to other people, but to animals, plants, minerals, electricity, air, objects, everything in existence. With this in mind, Genia asks, how can we respect the agency of the inherent life forces in everything around us? To explore such concepts, Genia creates multimedia installations of sound vessels, paintings, and video projections of her performances. In Genia's essay, Unseen Dimensions of Public Space, Disrupting Colonial Narratives, which I recommend reading the entire thing of and the link I can provide, she extends her conversation further from her installation work to a wider cultural inquiry. Interrogating the built environment, she writes, as a creative practitioner working in the public realm, I grapple with the disconnection between narratives surrounding public space and my reality as an indigenous Dakota artist. These narratives are founded on principles that stem from settler colonial notions of land ownership. How can people interested in public art think critically about this legacy to make work that addresses these complexities and disrupt the disparities uh, created by it? What methods can we use to create urban areas, monuments, art, and built environments that are responsive to these issues? Tonight, we have the privilege to learn more about how Erin Genia makes work to confront these complex issues. We'll have an opportunity to ask questions after a presentation. Um, as I said, use your hand raising function, um, and we'll try to keep the question and answer period organized. Um, so let's now make sure all cameras are on, mics off, and let's welcome Erin Genia. Thank you so much, Max. Greetings to everybody in the Department of Art community. It's really an honor to be here with you today. Wichokahe wash day. I'm a Dakota person. Um, I'm a member of the Sisseton Wapton Oyate, and I'm descended from the Little Traverse Bay Bands of Ottawa Indians. My pronouns are she, her. And I currently reside on the traditional homelands of the Massachusetts people. Um, and within the territories of the Nipmuc and Wampanoag tribes in Medford, Massachusetts. I am currently working as an artist in residence for the city of Boston. Um, and my work centers Dakota philosophies and amplifies the powerful presence of indigeneity on the occupied lands of America. So I just wanted to begin my talk tonight by telling you a little bit about myself. Um, I come from a family of artists. My grandmother was an artist. Uh, my uncle is a painter. All of my aunts and uncles are artists in some way, whether that is um, creating uh, star quilts or regalia or a variety of other um, types of things which in the fine arts world might be categorized as craft, um, but um, to, to me, they're artists. Um, my children are also artists, my son Samuel um, and my daughter Alexandra, they're both artists too. And so it's been uh, really um, a good life to have so many artists around me. Um, so I think what I'll do is I can begin by sharing my presentation with you now. So I'm just gonna take a second here and share my screen.
I've put together some work that we can look at and then we can talk about. Okay. Okay. Thanks for your patience. Okay. So um, as a Dakota artist working at the intersections of science and technology, civic arts practice, and indigenous people's cultural fortification, I have a really varied background that, that Max um, alluded to in the introduction. Um, I spent, have spent two decades as a community organizer um, working in the areas of human rights and environmental and economic justice. Um, as well as food justice and indigenous people's rights. And um, I decided that I wanted to get a master of public administration in tribal governance so that I could understand the ways in which tribal governments um, operate within the federal government system. I wanted to learn more about treaties and the, the histories of why um, the situation is what it is today for tribal communities. And so after having got my MPA in tribal governance, um, I worked professionally in the field of Native American higher education, as well as in um, arts and culture. And I worked um, for several years at the Longhouse Education and Cultural Center in Olympia, Washington. And there I worked with tribes um, and tribal um, artists to create tribally responsive programming and with a goal of um, fostering native arts and cultures. Um, I have also taught, I've taught at the Evergreen State College, um, teaching about contemporary native arts and contemporary um, tribal cultural heritage issues. Um, and it was that experience that um, led me to want to get a terminal art degree um, uh, to, to sort of tie together my um, upbringing as an artist and my pretty much daily practice as an artist and the community and, and um, tribal work that I have been engaged with. And so um, I graduated last year from MIT's Art, Culture and Technology program and um, during that time, I wrote uh, my thesis, um, which was about uh, Native artists working in the public sphere. And the, the article, Max, that you mentioned stemmed from my thesis work. And I've, I'm continuing to do, to build off of the work that um, I had started with my thesis. And I'll talk more about that later on in, in the presentation. So my, my work um, is based upon Dakota cultural frameworks and research methodologies. Part of the work that I did in um, creating, uh, writing the, my thesis was I was faced with a problem. Um, the academic models and research methodologies that I um, had available to me were not sufficient to um, cover Dakota culture. And so, um, you know, and there's a long history of why that is, because uh, academic institutions have, um, in many cases, and I think that, you know, is only now they are really beginning to come to terms and grapple with the legacy of contributing to the decimation of Native cultures and philosophies. Um, and because of the Western cultural um, supremacy that I encountered, uh, especially at a place like MIT, I realized that I needed to, uh, to come up with my own research methodology. And luckily, Dakota uh, philosophers, scholars, artists, writers have been active um, continuously. And so I have much to draw upon um, with regard to uh, 
a foundation in Dakota, in Dakota philosophy. And so I really had developed this research model based on Wo Dakota, which is a, a Dakota framework. Um, basically what it is, is it teaches people how to act in a reciprocal and respectful way in the world. You know, essentially that's what it boils down to. And I applied that using um, a decolonization and critical race um, research methodologies as well, you know, to, to come up with the, uh, I guess, a hybrid research methodology. So that, that really is the basis for the work that I've been doing. And um, you know, the reason why I um, have needed to do this is because of the assimilation um, the U.S. assimilation policies that went hand in hand with hand in hand with the genocide policies against indigenous people in this country, and um, so many. Uh, this reaches into so many different aspects of of life for me as a as a native person. Um, you know, I'm a product of these U.S. assimilation policies that basically have stripped my family members of our culture and forcing us to adopt American ways um, for survival. The year I was born, 1978, was the year that the American Indian Religious Freedom Act was ratified. So it, I'm really part of this first generation of Native Americans who are able to freely practice and preserve our living cultural traditions and religions. And so that's a pretty intense um, responsibility um, it's a sacred responsibility, actually, and, and it often places me at odds with dominant structures and attitudes. Um, so, you know, that's just more about kind of like the framework and the, uh, the context that my work um, stems from. So having said that, you know, I, I really like to kind of test the boundaries of contemporary art a little bit and from my perspective as a Native person and um, with a goal of working towards cultural revitalization. And um, my favorite media to work in um, are sound, stone carving, sculpture, painting, ceramics, fiber arts, printmaking, and performance. So I do just a variety of, of these methods um, for a given piece. And I think what I'll do right now is I'll start off with a, this is actually my, my most recent and most exciting, I think, um, piece. It's called Chanupa Ion, Falling Star Woman. And as Max mentioned in the beginning, this piece uh, traveled to the International Space Station. Um, so this, this piece actually has come about through many, many years of research. I have started this project um, several years ago when my dad gave me a piece of pipestone to carve. Pipestone is a, also known as Chanupa Ion, and it's a sacred material that um, Dakota people use for a variety of different purposes. And you really can only um, quarry it in one place, which is um, what is today known as Pipestone National Monument in Minnesota. And so he brought me this piece of pipestone and I started carving it and I realized that I did not have a strong background in traditional Dakota form. And I wanted to learn more about the protocols around the sacred usage of this material. Um, you know, our, our family and our people have been quarrying this, this um, stone for millennia and um, you know because of the US assimilation policies I did not I did not have that uh, that information. So what I did was I began to travel all over the country to look at collections, museum collections and um, to study the Chanupa Ion pieces that reside in those museum collections. And so I've been to many different museums around the country and just spending time with those pieces, observing them, documenting them, drawing them, you know, uh, being with them. And um, I learned so much about not only traditional Dakota forms, but also the politics of museums and how they relate to Dakota people's cultural patrimony. And so that is another aspect of my work. So anyway, that's kind of just like, 
the background of uh, Chanupa Ion, uh, the, the, um, the context of this work. And so um, the piece, this, pro this project is really interesting because it began um, as Sojourner 2020, which was it or is a, a project of the MIT Media Lab Space Exploration Initiative. And it is a unit, which you can see there down on, on, on the bottom, um, that little rectangular unit. It has three different layers of rotating, um, um, rotating layers where capsules uh, are inserted into the layers and they kind of spin at different, uh, different gravities. They spin at, uh, one was just actually staying still the other two were spinning at lunar and Martian um, rates of, of gravity. And so um, there were about 10 artist artist projects that were included in this um, experiment, I guess, that went up to the International Space Station. And it was up on the ISS for about a month. And during that time, it traveled over 4 million miles. Um, I presented a little bit about it at the Ars Electronica Festival a few days ago. And, you know, this piece has been really important to me because it um, expresses what I believe is that is the, it is essential for indigenous practitioners um, to be at the table in, in any discussions around science technology and, and, you know, now this frontier of space travel. And so what you see here in the imagery is, you can see that it's in my hand there and just how tiny it is. Any, anytime something goes up into space, you know, it really costs a lot of money to get it there and a lot of resources to get it there. And um, we had to work within a very small, um, you know, very limited space to create this piece. And so luckily um, in my practice of working with Pipestone, uh, part of the protocols of working with the stone is that you don't waste any of it because it's sacred. So I happen to have a lot of little tiny shards and pieces that I could use to, to put it into the, the unit. And here you can see the Dragon capsule docking with the International Space Station. Um, I'm going to move to the next slide here. And I thought I would just play a video that talks about the story behind uh, the um, it's a three-minute video, uh, the story behind Falling Star Woman. So hopefully this... Can you hear this? Yes. Okay, thank you. Chanupa Eong, Falling Star Woman. Eon, Falling Star Woman, will be launched into orbit on the International Space Station as part of the Sojourner 2020 project. Carved from the traditional Dakota material of Chanupa Eon, also known as pipestone or catlinite, this tiny piece depicts the legend of a stargazing young woman who travels to space, marries a star person, and gives birth to a star child. Over time, she misses her family, friends, and her work as a plant medicine healer. She decides to leave her home in the stars and return to her people on Earth. Using the thread of her woven dress as a rope, she climbs down from the stars. However, the thread is not long enough. She lets go and tumbles down to the Earth as a wakan wokpa, falling star. The carving? which weighs only 0 0.86 grams, shows the moment she is transformed into a falling star. Chanupa Ion is a sacred material, so this piece was prepared for its journey in orbit through ceremony. It represents 
a symbolic prayer for peace and for the self-determination of indigenous people all over the globe. video of watching the International Space Station pass overhead of, over our house. And this was a really amazing um, thing to see. Uh, and anybody can see it. You know, you can go to the website and sign up to see whenever the International Space Station passes overhead, but it's really quite large. Um, I'll play this. You can see the kind of tiny dot there. Um, but it's about 260 miles above the Earth. In, um, in orbit. And the piece, Chanu Ba'ion, spent that entire month floating in microgravity um, as the International Space Station orbits the Earth once every uh, 90 minutes. Okay, um, so another work uh, that I've been uh, engaged with recently, and ha it has had many different iterations, is a project called Sound Vessels. And Sound Vessels are essentially ceramic sculptures that transmit sound. Um, and the sound uh, is a material just this, in the same way that the clay and the glaze um, are materials in the pieces. I, the process for creating the sound vessels involves first listening and then um, recording different ambient sounds um, or playing instruments or speaking um, either spoken word pieces or Dakota language. Um, and then uh, I create different sound um, compositions that are then um, played through the pieces themselves uh, with a surface transducer. And you can see here on the upper right hand side, this is the brain of the um, sound vessels unit. Um, this is what you see here in the larger picture is an installation of sound vessels at the Urbano project. And for this iteration of the sound vessels, I wanted to experiment with hiding the um, brain. In, in other iterations, the brain has been out there, you know, as part of the piece. But I thought that I would try this time by putting the brain inside. And um, it added a bit of air of mystery, I guess, to, to the uh, piece. But essentially, each of these different sculptures that you see here are transmitting a different channel of sound. And all of the timings are different. And so it basically is a random orchestration of, of various different sounds. And I've got um, a couple of examples here. Thank mm -hmm. you. 
this piece that you see down here in the uh, lower on the lower right hand side is one what one of the sound vessels look like looks like so when I after I've created the sound composition I then um, try to figure out what kind of amplification shape the sound composition should have. And then I build that in the clay. And so this one here um, was built to, um, to project a sound of a cicada. And I don't have that sample of the sound with me, but I do have I will often go and do some recording in, um, you know, out in the woods or, you know, by the water or something like that. So I like to include uh, bugs and frogs and stuff. So um, I'll see if I can play. I just wanted to add another follow-up to that last slide there. Let's go back. Um, that the sound that you heard in the at the end of that or that sound clip is the sound of an avalanche and a, uh, a um, uh, explosion. And some of these pieces here are um, they're forms that are created to show mining strip mining operations in the earth. So you can see kind of one right up here in the lower right hand side. Um, I created those to because I wanted to, to sort of have a way to think about um, the technology that we use that creates, um, you know, this, the, 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 the copper wires and the motherboards and the things, the minerals that come out of the earth that um, contribute to this, these technologies that we use. And um, so that's why I decided to put some sounds of that destruction, you know, into this uh, sound piece. So earthling, earthling is just, a, earthling is something that I have a lot of fun with. It's a, it's a character, it's a, it's a person, it's a being, it's um, both playful and unnerving. So I really started, first started to do earthling as a way to just kind of freak people out in public. Um, <laughs> And so I would, I made this mask here and um, I have, a, you know, the outfit and I would just walk around in public places like that. Um, I mean, there is a deeper reason to this, but I think, you know, also on a personal level, it was a way for me to like um, sort of express some frustration with this sort of um, dichotomy, I guess I feel of being a Dakota person uh, in, in a very like Western Western society that I am a product of too. Um, so there's like a uh, irony there, but um, so what I was really trying to express with Earthling is this, you know, Dakota concept that Max uh, read and uh, brought up at the beginning that that this philosophy of uh, Mitakuye Oyasi, which means we are all related, and that translates into basically that everything is alive. Everything in the universe is part of a, a giant life force and that we respect that life force for what it is and we have built our society on that understanding. Um, you know, like I feel like Western science is kind of slowly coming around to that understanding, but um, for us, that is something that, that interconnectedness is something that we have always known. And so to me, that's just such a powerful gift uh, of this uh, legacy of Dakota philosophy. And drawing from that, I created Earthling to show that 
human beings are not separate from the earth. Um, essentially that we are the earth, that we're, you know, we're not even like a product, of, well, well, we are a product of the earth, but, but we, are, we are the earth itself, just as in, in the way that cells in our body are a part of us, you know, they are us, we are the earth. And so we have, you know, that, um, that kind of like responsibility uh, to this kind of larger thing. And so, um, let's see here. So I recently did this live performance of Earthing that I just wanted to show you 30 seconds of, if I could. Um, I couldn't embed it into the thing. Um, but basically, like, Earthling is master of the mundane. So um, any, anything that a person does, Earthling does too. And uh, this, is, this is just a, a short clip of the um, performance that I did. Sure that, that we're on still on time here. Um, so this this next piece that you're looking at here, you know, I work with sound, and um, I started to think of like the drum as something that I have been raised around ever since I was a little girl, and uh, thinking about the vibrations produced by a drum. Um, this piece, acoustic teepee, is a uh, basically a device that amplifies those drum sounds um, and expresses this uh, Dakota story of the Wakion and the um, Unkehi, which are basically um, supernatural creatures that are um, the power, they represent the power of storms and the power of water water and flooding and um, so really this these story the story is a way to discuss for me climate change using you know um, Dakota um, characters Dakota Dakota um, elements to talk about climate change and this piece that you see here I mean the location of where it is is at the Venice Biennale at the Lithuania pavilion um, and it, it's an interesting piece because people can sort of gather around this piece um, at one time and play, play the drum. Um, so here's just a short clip. Yeah, and so um, Earthling, uh, I'm sorry, Acoustic Teepee is a piece that um, I specifically wanted to place in the Venice Lagoon as a ground zero site for climate change and as a way to sort of amplify these vibrations that, you know, because each, each um, beat of the drum is a prayer and a, and a communication um, to those, uh, to those, um, in those beings, those um, sacred beings. So, let's see here. Um, and I think I'll try to go a little bit faster now because I just want to make sure we have enough time. Um, this is, I've, I've been playing a lot uh, recently with light itself and playing around with the colors of light. And um, in my previous years, I worked a lot with more with pigments and as a painter. And uh, then I became very interested in the qualities of the light itself in terms of the colors that, uh, that are transmitted. And I created this um, Morning Star Light Chamber, which is a projection device that um, can be programmed to uh, project 
different uh, colors on the RGB spectrum and it rotates and it pr can project at a different angle. So it's kind of like a fun thing to use at a party, I guess. Um, not that I'll be having a party anytime soon, but um, here you can see um, some of the colors you know, that are projected through the morning starlight chamber. Um, and then I also work in textiles as well in fiber arts. And this piece um, is called Invisible. And I made this piece as a way to, as basically to create a symbolic skin of protection for myself against pervasive cultural supremacy. Um, the Morning Star form is, a, is an expression of Dakota cultural power. And here I'm using it to transform white cultural supremacy, uh, which expropriates and erases other cultures um, into a protective, you know, skin. And um, so this particular piece um, is also, I guess, a performative piece as well. Um, this, I recently, um, you know, I've been working a lot with the this image of the, it's called Ampa Owichafi, this morning star. And um, it is a visual representation of many, many things in Dakota culture. Um, I won't go into what those things are, but it, there's a lot going on with this image. And so um, for this piece in this, what you see here is a, what is called counting coup. I took this fourth world flag and I placed it a, a on the balcony in, in um, building seven of MIT as a way to, um, counting coup is a, is a Dakota uh, warfare method where you basically tap, tap your enemy on the shoulder. Um, you don't kill them, but um, I wanted to do this because being at the institution, I felt that my uh, beliefs were in some ways belittled or not taken seriously. Um, and I knew that there's a long history of that, um, not just at MIT, but in, I think in academic institutions in general. And the, the fourth world flag, um, there's a quote that uh, by George Manuel, who is the world, he was the World Council of Indigenous Peoples president in the 1970s. And he said, uh, he defined the fourth world the fourth world is the name given to indigenous peoples descended from a country's aboriginal population and who today are completely or partly deprived of their right to their own territories and its riches. The peoples of the fourth world have only limited influence or none at all in the nation, national state to which they belong. Um, so I created this morning star form um, using many colors of the rainbow to show the great diversity of of native people, of indigenous people as well, because I, I also feel that, um, you know, there's many, many tribes and every tribe has its own culture and its own language and its own particular histories and relationships to each other and relationships to the colonizing powers around it. So um, that's what this flag represents. Um, I just wanna make sure uh, that we're Okay, on time. Uh, how much time do you think we can continue for? Uh, yeah, you're doing. You're, uh, see, we started a little bit late, uh -huh. um, so you know, feel just feel free to. I want to make sure that you cover what okay. you want. Yeah. Oh, thank you. Great. Okay, so um, this piece here is called "After Powhatan's Robe." And I wonder if is anyone knowledgeable or have seen uh, Powhatan's mantle? It's a historic piece. Um, and um, I made this piece in Salzburg. I was doing a residency and I was, my studio space was in a fortress in, on top of the hill, a Hohen Salzburg fortress. And I had the chance while I was there to visit a cabinet of curiosity, like one of the original cabinets of curiosity from hundreds of years ago is uh, you know, still there. 
in a palace down below. And um, it really got me to thinking um, about the legacy of these cabinets of curiosity, these wunderkammer. Uh, and, um, you know, as a native person, um, many, in many cases, these cabinets of curiosity have housed some of our, uh, you know, items of patrimony and our, and our cultural items. Um, and the way that, I don't know, you know, how much you know about these cabinets of curiosity, but essentially what they, what they are as a way to classify and and um, display um, different things. So things are classified animal, mineral, vegetable, and, ma and man-made. And so within these cabinets, um, royal and wealthy people in Europe would have explorers go out and collect um, different things, and then they would keep these things in these cabinets. And a very, you know, very kind of colonial way to to look at at the world. And so, as I started to do some research on these Wunderkammer and looking at them as a precursor to modern day museums, um, I f I came across this amazing piece called uh, Powhatan's Mantle. And it turns out that this piece actually. Um, was in the first public museum ever, the Ashmolean Museum, um, which opened in 1683 in Oxford, England. And it came uh, through this collection called the Tradescant Collection, which was um, basically a cabinet of curiosity to one of the kings at the time. And this piece is just so beautiful. It is, um, it's an intricately beaded hide um, using um, shells called Roanoke shells. Um, and it has said to have been um, owned by uh, the sachem there uh, called Wahonsaka. And, um, you know, I, I've never actually seen the piece in person, but just from pictures alone, I could kind of sense how amazing this piece was. And I just was overcome by this feeling of sadness that, um, the culture that created that piece, um, you know, had been decimated by colonization and just oh, feeling overwhelmed by that sort of kind of same mentality, honestly, that was used to deprive people of their lands, lives and cultural properties in some ways still continues to this day. Um, and, you know, I wanted to really think critically about that in terms of the context of these museums, museum collections that um, really stem from this tradition of the cabinets of curiosity. You know, it, it's, it was upsetting to learn that a piece of such cultural significance ended up, you know, as a muse in a museum as, as an oddity, a specimen a prize, um, which has really set the tone, I think, for how museums interact with native people and our, and our um, our cultural um, and art pieces, you know, are basically our masterpieces. Um, so I created this piece here. Initially, I tried to reconstruct it, and I, there was just no way. I mean, the thing is just absolutely amazing. Like, there's no way I could do it. So I created this spiral of, of shells um, to show that, you know, even though this has happened to our people, you know, we are still, um, we're still continuing and this, the shells are spaced out um, to show that like the, in the original piece of Powhatan's mantle, the shells are all together and there's many, many of the shells in the spiral. It's a very tight spiral and this one is very loose and spread out. Um, so, so that's what this piece is. It's, it's a reflection on that legacy. Um, so then I, you know, have really in recent years also started to think more about my work as occupying in occupying public space because feeling, you know, somewhat closed in by this museum uh, construct. Um, and then starting to think about how public spaces um, can be much more accessible to people. Um, and so I really have been aiming to do more work lately in public space. And um, 
So as a result of that, in the, I created this piece here that was exhibited as a temporary piece at the Seattle Center for a year. And it's called Ampa Owichaki uh, Dakota Pride Banner. And um, I created this piece because in the 1960s, the, the United States um, government created this program called Indian Urbanization, or, uh, um, Urban Relocation. And basically what that meant for Native people living in uh, on reservations was that they were encouraged to leave the reservation and go live in the cities. And so now, you know, there's, as a result of that, many urban Native people. Um, and that's how, you know, my, my family ended up in New York um, because of that. And so um, I um, created this piece because, you know, there's many of us in cities and yet we very rarely see um, imagery that speaks to our culture or that comes from our culture. And so I wanted to put something, you know, in the space that would enliven the space and also, you know, pay homage, I guess, to uh, the many urban native people um, living there. So, um, so yeah, so I, I thought I would share this information too. So, you know, as a result of working in public space, um, I've been thinking a lot about what does that mean? What is public space on occupied lands? What does that mean in a settler colonial context? You know, this sort of public and private binary of ownership, excuse me. Um, so as a result of that, I'm organizing this conference with the New England Foundation of the Arts that is happening um, next week. And um, if you're interested in learning more, you can go to the NIFA website and look up Centering Justice. Basically what it is, is artists, native artists um, from a variety of different form, media, art media forms coming together to talk about these different issues uh, that you see here in this in the sessions and um, I don't want to take up too much time talking about this, but this is part of my work as well. I do um, I do a lot of organizing in my community and I always feel that my work um, uh, you know is part of my practice to work with other native artists and my work um, working in the studio is what it is, but it's it's enhanced when I can work with others and when, you know, other people have opportunities um, to speak as well. And that, um, that is part of that. So um, I'm currently, as I mentioned at the beginning of the presentation, I am currently an artist in residence for the city of Boston. And I've been working with the Department of Emergency Management that's a very interesting model what they do. They, they, they embed an artist in a city office and the artist then rethinks things and um, creates works that respond to, you know, whatever might be happening. So earlier this year, as a result of COVID-19, um, the mayor of Boston declared racism to be a public health emergency because the, it was such a huge disparity of people of color um, contracting and suffering from COVID-19 um, than, um, than, than white people and affluent people. And so, um, at, you know, and then at that time, um, the Black Lives Matter movement was happening and, you know, monuments um, that had been in question for many, many years and started to come down all over the world. And, you know, in this vein of thinking about public space and public monuments um, and living in Boston, which is a place that seriously loves its colonial history, um, I wanted to interrogate that a bit. And, you know, um, Native people in this place are very invisibilized and I would even say hyper marginalized because of this colonial history, you know, and like walking down the street, you see these monuments that um, are pretty offensive. And so I put together this panel of speakers, native leaders, artists, and allies um, to talk about these issues. And I'll just play the little clip. It's like a trailer, which you can go to the website and look at all of them. There's like four and a half hours of, of talking. <laughs> if, you, if you have time, you can look at that. 
Um, but this is just a clip of, you know, some of the highlights. Living in these colonial cities, in my experience, I am choking, suffering, like, on visual representation that demands that I don't exist. How do you see monuments and memorials in the public sphere contributing to the public health emergency of racism and affecting the day-to-day -day lives of indigenous people in your communities? What work are you doing to combat this or to draw attention to this? Things are so covered up here and it has an impact in how, it has an impact when we go out and we're trying to talk to non-native people about things and trying to link our struggles together and the reason is because so many people in this state actually think that we're extinct all the way down the walkway was nothing but monuments honoring these colonizers um and you know they're towering over you seeing the, the letters be kind of carved into the stone it's like by having to endure that and then also to be erased simultaneously. When we're looking at public spaces, what what is the reverence that is that is evoked from that? What when we are walking the pathways of our ancestors, where are those spots that evoke, my goodness, you know, I need to leave an offering here. And for us, what it is very important, it is to uncover what it is the history and the networks that actually make possible those monuments and those names to happen, that actually make possible to perpetuate uh, the normalization of white supremacy. Perhaps space needs to be made in our society for to think of indigenous art as well as having that same sort of weight and importance both I ideologically and materially. So when we're talking about monuments, change, representation, where are the indigenous people, um, many of us are tending to historical trauma. Many of us are just trying to survive. The monument about Christopher, from, of Christopher Columbus is not about the past. When we put up a monument, it's about the present. So to be really clear when we're thinking about what monuments we're putting up is what are we saying about ourselves? What are we presenting about ourselves? What, are, what do we want the world to see about ourselves? And that's everything that I have for you today. Uh, I'm gonna stop screen sharing. Hi, uh, can you hear me now? Yes. Uh, hi. Th thanks so much for your talk. Um, really enjoyed learning a little bit more about your work. I'm gonna um, give our group here um, the opportunity to talk directly to you. I just had one kind of very broad question, maybe to start off um, as people are gathering their thoughts. Um, you answered a little bit of my question in the end there, but I, I'm just always very interested in um, when artists are working on public projects or projects that take place outside of conventional spaces for the reception of art. Um, what kind of um, opportunities you have for feedback from your various publics, because your work speaks on so many channels, especially, but in general, I think it's always an interesting kind of conundrum. So what, you know, what kinds of ways um, can you um, get a sense of the response to your work um, from these publics? And then what ways um, do you, um, have the opportunity to respond to those things that things are you know become um, not just a fixed object in the in a traditional public artwork vein a formal thing in the space but actually something that's as you're pointing out very alive 
and very, um, not like a, a conclusion, but more an inquiry. Yes, thank you. Um, I guess I would just start off by saying that it's really messy. Working in the public realm is very difficult. Um, everybody brings their own experiences, their own opinions, and their own cultural backgrounds and ideologies to this space. And, um, you know, very rarely do people ever agree. Um, and so I guess I feel that, that that's a good thing um, because if, if, if these things are coming up for people, like if, if issues are coming up that people don't agree on, the, then the piece gives them an opportunity to talk about that. And it gives them the chance to maybe either change their mind or, or you know, understand it a little bit differently from someone else's perspective, or maybe not change their mind, maybe you know, be more s solid in their um, understanding. And so um, while it's hard though, I have to say it, it is really hard to be sort of at that nexus, like it takes a toll, um, but it's also very like exciting too. Um, and then in terms of feedback, um, I think with the piece, the piece that I made, the Dakota Pride banner, um, I got a lot of really good feedback on that. But I think, you know, people kind of have to go out of their way to give you the feedback if they like it. And so if they don't like it or if they don't care about it, then you're just maybe not going to hear from them unless they really hate it. Um, but it did get torn down a couple of times too. So I don't know if that was also a, you know, sometimes because these public pieces, uh, you know, they're taking up, they're, they're in people's, People take their public space personally, you know, that's their space. So um, if it's like offensive or if it's something that they don't agree with maybe, then they can physically do something about that. Um, mm -hmm. So I, I don't know if it, maybe that was a, either an indictment on the piece or mm -hmm. was it they just were playing around? I don't know, who knows? Mm -hmm. Does that answer your question? Yeah, thank you. Um, before I kind of follow up, and I don't want to take over, I want to give everyone else the opportunity. I see that we've had a lot of activity, and it's maybe maybe the um, easiest way to do it is to see if it works to just ask you to speak up. There are some questions I saw along the way of some ranging from like technical questions about materials to things that were more broad than that. So uh, maybe we'll just try that. Feel free to open your mic and and uh, and take the chance to ask your question. I have a question. Um, so I think that stepping out in the earthling costume, like for me is very brave. So perhaps you, that's awesome. Do you feel like your artwork has like always been kind of bold and brave or was there a switch from it being more of like an introverted just for me artwork to being more of like the movement that you're trying to make it? That's a great question. Thank you. Um, I think it was more introverted. Um, when I was earlier in my practice. I didn't have the confidence um, yet. But you know, after years of doing it, I guess it's kind of like, well, what do I have to lose? Plus, nobody can see my face <laughs> when, <laughs> when I have the costume on. So it's like, it almost is like uh, freeing in a way. Um, you know, I, I don't feel so embarrassed because it's, as far as anyone knows, like, who is that? So, um, yeah, uh, that's a good question. Thank you. Does that answer, answer your question? Yeah, thank you. Mm -hmm. uh, next question, who wants to? Wants uh, to the one? I guess since you referenced the Academy and like some of the um, difficulties with the paradigms that the Academy presents. Like it's, it's also interesting to me that you, you went to Evergreen, my brother went there. So I know that's a very important school that kind of looks at education in a critical way. So I guess maybe I'm, I'm wondering, maybe just like what's your art practice in relationship to different institutions? 
Yeah, thank you. That's that's a, a really great point. And um, I think I have a very healthy distrust um, because of the way that education has been used as a tool of genocide uh, with, with starting with the boarding school system against Dakota people. And, um, you know, so that is just so deeply embedded in my understanding of the education system in general that I bring a healthy distrust with me. Um, you know, and at the same time, like I, I think I struggled a lot when I was in art school um, too, when I went to the Institute of American Indian Arts. I struggled um, because I felt um, maybe constricted. Um, but then, you know, I realized that what a gift it was to have that space, you know, in this sort of capitalistic society that we're in when you have the space and time to put in energy into really developing your own um, ideas, your own uh, things that are so deep within you, you know, if you have a, a channel to bring those out and to make that constructive, um, that's a gift. And, you know, you may have to interact with these systems that can be very oppressive, but if, as long as you bring that sort of criticalness to it, um, and questioning it of it, I think that, you know, that's a way to get through it. Um, and I still bring that distrust with me. You know, I still, I think that t telling this, speaking this truth as I understand it is, um, is, is also something that you can do in the academy as well. And maybe you can't necessarily do that in other, other circles, other, other arenas. Thank you. Thank you for that. Um, uh, is there anybody else who has a question, something in mind? I do have something in mind. Um, I was just, I think it's so brave, like your art is representing a culture that is not being seen. What would be your, um, I don't know if you have an end goal to, or what could be ideal for you to see your culture, your culture to come together or like just to reach out to others and maybe you guys can, you know, be together again or like what would be the end goal? Thank you. Um, that's, that's a great question. Um, I don't think there is an end goal. I think that I see it in a continuum of what is my responsibility to my culture and how can I use the tools uh, and resources at my disposal to um, help, you know, to, to make things better for, for my people, for my culture, which has been so, you know, it basically really needs a lot of work. There's a lot of work that needs to be done. Um, and I don't know what all that work is. I don't, all I know is that, um, I have a small part in that and that I, you know, um, when I can, when I consider my role in that continuum, you know, I think to myself, well, what I have, I have kids, you know, and I, and mm -hmm. I think, you know, what about their kids and what about their kids and stuff like that. So when I see it in that continuum, you know, I just feel like I must do my part. Yes. Yeah, it's an important part. It's part of your essence and it's like finding yourself in a culture that you haven't been or seen for a long time. So it is amazing for others that are like immigrants and that we lose ourselves. So it's it's pretty awesome to see what you're into. Thank you. Yes. Thank you very much. I have a question. Um, so I can tell you're very personal with what you're doing. Um, your artwork is very reminiscent, reminiscent of you and your spirit. Do you ever try to stray towards that and not have a identity piece? And if you do, how, what do you do? Because I'm very similar. I also really like to do my culture pieces and pieces that really identify with me and about change, but um, I have a hard time with trying to stray away from that. So I was just wondering. 
Yeah, thank you. I think, you know, my process is wide ranging. And so what you see here right now is sort of like the end of that process. And much of that just also begins with pure expression. You know, like I, I go in there with my materials into my studio right here behind me and I, I just do whatever comes out. And, and then, you know, begin to, that begins to come in, form into something else. So I think that's a part of the process. Um, and then eventually, you know, it turns into this thing um, that does include those other aspects. I, I think that I try to do it that way because I want it to have some relevance. But there's a lot of pieces that I make that, that don't have any relevance and that they're just stuff that I made. And maybe it's bad or maybe it's, you know, just maybe it doesn't not bad or good it's just a thing um and that's interesting too i guess um, while we're waiting for the next question i have a kind of more detail oriented question just like a technical question um but relates to this idea of articulations um in in different ways and different different media um, in your, I really, uh, really like those um, amplification shapes um, in the um, in the pieces, uh, the sound vessel pieces. I think they're, you refer to them as. And I was just curious how, um, like, what the processes you use to determine those shapes. Um, it seems is that subjective, or are you looking like at some kind of acoustical? Um, kind of software that determines them and then you make a kind of translation into that material? Um, well, I do use software to produce the sound pieces themselves. Um, and I think, you know, whenever I use the software, I can see the waves of the sound vis visualized. And that does help me when I, um, you know, am working with the clay, but when I'm working with the clay and listening to the pieces, it really is more of an organic moment of um, trying to figure out how that sound would best be amplified through a shape, uh, through a form. You know, what thickness does that clay wall have to be? What, uh, what curvature um, needs to be in a certain place? Um, or not. Um, so I guess it's more of an organic process, which is um, sometimes it works and sometimes it doesn't work, you know, like, um, so it's very much one, one of the things I really like about the sound vessels is that it's, it's a test. Every iteration of that project is a, is a test. I learned something from the last one and now I'm going to try this. And um, um, yeah, does that answer your question? Yeah, thank you. No, I, I love the the relationship between you know a sonic work, something that ha is a kind of ephemera, and then kind of capturing this kind of form that you intuit that it both has a form and eludes that form at the same time. Uh, thank you. Uh, I think we have a, a little more time. How are you feeling? We have time for any more questions or yeah, no, I love it. Uh, those of you out there. Uh, come on, I know that there are some comments in the... I got one, I think. Yeah, okay. It's more of like a specific question, I guess, because I was really drawn to the acoustic TV. Um, not only was the design on the physical material just beautiful, but I really was like taken back by all the symbolism held within it. Um, and I was sort of wondering if you ever considered expanding on that more, um, maybe making more of the pieces so you get a multitude of sound or can more than one person play on the drums at a time? I'm not sure if that's, you know, a practice um, in which there's only one person doing it. I, I would love to know more about it, basically. <laughs> yeah, thank you. Um... I actually had thought when I initially did the project um, that it would that acoustic TV would be a part of a circle of 
acoustic teepees. Um, because those, the, you know, a teepee is a, it's a, it's a home. And it's a home, acoustic teepee is a home for those vibrations. And the way that those um, teepees are set up is they're usually set up in kind of like a huge area in a circle. And so I thought, you know, that would be a really cool public art piece that um, there would be like a circle of teepees and each one had a different thing that they did. Um, so maybe a project for the future. <laughs> But, but multiple people, like up to four people can play acoustic TV at one time because all of the drums are different sizes. And they have, so they have different tones that come out of the drums. Um, so when, it, when four people are actually playing that, that's like when it's maxed out, you know, that's the, um, it sounds really cool um, when four people are playing it. Cool, I'll definitely be looking for that in the future. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> I think there's a question from uh, first David uh, and uh, Monroy um, Berganza, and then from Beatrice. David? Do you have your mic activated, David? I can't hear. Uh, it, uh, David, what, if, if you look into your mic, um, see if you can figure that out. Um, we'll, we'll come back to you and maybe Beatrice, uh, maybe you have a question. Hello. Um, thank you for speaking and being here with everyone tonight. Um, I was just wondering, because you're talking about how um, you had a lot of artists in your family and that you work closely with other Native artists, like more in the present. So I was wondering if you have or had any Native artists that were inspirational to you or if you were mainly influenced by your family or if like was there a turning point that made you want to pursue art more seriously? Thank you. That's a great question. Um, I'll start with the first one first with the last question first that's about a turning point that um actually yes and it did involve other native artists i i was you know working as an arts administrator and um i had my practice on the side and i was working at the longhouse and helping other native artists like with technical assistance and we did grant programs and residencies and all these things so i got to know a lot of people working I work in the Pacific Northwest, which um, I encourage everyone to study the native art of the Pacific Northwest because it's just like mind bogglingly amazing. Um, the carvings and the um, performance and just there's so much about the, uh, the artwork there that is like incredibly inspiring. Mm -hmm. I would say that that was an influence, but then um, I was invited to participate in an international artist indigenous artists gathering of the Pacific Rim. Mm -hmm. And um, I went to New Zealand and there were about a hundred native artists there from all over the world. And it was just like this incredible moment of being like, I need to stop everything that I'm doing and just like focus on art now. So at that time I was like, in five years, I want to be a professional artist and I want to transition away from, um, you know, the the more administrative stuff, which I do think is important. And I do think that that had a, uh, helped me as an artist, but you know, to have space and time to do your practice is, is not easy in this world. You know, like a lot of times you have to have a job or have another thing to, to sustain that. But at that stage, I was basically just like, I need to figure out a way, you know, to do this. Cause I was just so inspired by so many living artists, um, that I was working with at that time. And there's a ton of amazing native artists that are practicing now that I'm inspired by. Um, I did an internship at the National Museum of the American Indian in DC, and I learned more about contemporary native artists there as well. Um, I mean, I just encourage everyone to look at uh, what's happening with, with native artists um, 
there's just some really interesting things happening. Um, I'd say indigenous artists across the world. Really cool stuff. That's awesome. Thank you so much. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Is um, there there's another question I'm waiting to receive. Okay. By writing here because there's a mic problem. In the meantime, is there anyone else? Uh, um, I, have, I have one question okay. um, regarding um, your piece after Powhatan's robe. Um, I saw in the chat, I, I stepped off briefly, um, you uh, use animal hide for the, the canvas material here? I actually know the, the piece itself is made from animal hide, um, oh, okay. you know, the ancestral piece. But okay. the but mine was just basically, I found an old curtain and um, used that. Okay, I was just, and I was wondering um, how, how much um, like found objects um, bleed into your work? Like, is that an important aspect? Oh yeah, that's a great question, thank you. Um, so, you know, I often get this question from folks like wanting to know about traditional materials versus contemporary materials. And um, I think that this is related to your question. And um, I, when I was working in the Pacific Northwest there, a basket weaver um, uh, by the name of Hazel Peet um, was a very influential woman. Um, and she passed away and her daughters carried on her legacy of teaching basket weaving. Um, and so I learned, I was friends with them. And so I learned about her, what she did. And one of the things she said was, um, we have always used what is available to us and today we have the world. And so that's the answer that I give when somebody asks a question like, you know, about sort of like, you know, would, would as a native artist, do you use more like traditional kind of materials? And what is that? What does that mean? But I, so I basically use what, what is available to me, you know, um, and sometimes I'll have an affinity with some objects within my vicinity and I'll just use those. I, and I actually started to use some found objects with the sound vessels more recently as well, just thinking about how, um, how these regular objects, like old pieces of recycling and stuff like that, mm -hmm. um, would reverberate, how they would project sound. Um, and in this piece, um, the rope piece, those are shells on top or They're actually clay. I made them clay. out of clay. Okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah, because um, I didn't have access to shells, so I just used clay. Okay, thank you. Yeah, thank you. Um, so there's a question here. I could read it or maybe, oh yes, I, I should read it to you. Um, this is coming from David Monroy Berganza. Um, as someone who is an immigrant from Guatemala and of indigenous blood, seeing the cultural differences and the teachings from there and over here have been really interesting over, have been really interesting. In the public schooling in Guatemala, some of the first subjects um, taught about um, native culture, um, uh, so I'm, I'm sorry, I'm trying to paraphrase this as well. Uh, some of the first subjects um, uh, that are taught are about native culture, whereas here they teach about people, um, discoverers like Christopher Columbus. Um, I agree that we that he should not be praised as he should be. Um, in we should discuss more about native history. Uh, I do believe it's imp an important part of American history as a whole. How do you believe that we should expose young Americans to that darker side of our history? And when should that happen? Thank you, David. Um, that's a very uh, interesting thing to think about. Um, I mean, I think, I guess, I guess the problem here in the United States from my perspective is that there's sort of a mythology that is taught from the time a child goes into their first um, classes. And I've dealt with that, you know, I've got multiple children and 
they've gone through the system. My oldest son is 19 now, so he's, you know, gone through the whole thing almost. And um, from the time that they enter school, these, these mythologies begin. And I think that we, you know, we really need to have an honest conversation about our colonial past and what that means. I think that we're, we can't really move forward without being honest about uh, this history and what, you know, how it has impacted our situation today, like with, with what we're seeing with um, institutionalized racism having such a horrible effect on people's ability to survive and thrive. Um, and, you know, economic disparities and uh, just through the roof, you know, and, and, and climate change as a result of colonial mentality. Um, you know, these things have an impact in how they play out in the world. Um, so I guess, I guess it's not so much as of when we need to begin, which, you know, we need, I think we do need to begin as, as soon as children can understand things, but it's what are we teaching and, um, and, and, and why um, is how I see it, I guess. Does that, does that help? Does that kind of answer the question a bit? I think that's a, I think that's kind of like a really large question and would take a really long time to consider that and think, you know, think that one through. Great, thank you. Oh, there's a question from Tyler Leno. Uh, do you wanna ask your question or would you like me to, or? Oh, I think it's visible, yeah, you can see. Aaron, you can see that question, right? Uh, oh yeah, um, why do you think we as human beings identify so much with our cultural heritage? Throughout history, people have identified themselves within a group of their own and mostly rejected their individuality. Um, well, I, I guess um, I would say to that, that I can, I can think about that from my perspective as a Dakota person. Um, our people have been able to survive and thrive for thousands of years because of the, the cultural teachings of our ancestors. And um, because we've been able to survive that way, um, it makes sense that we would identify with those things. Um, you know, I think, I guess, I guess maybe at the heart of your question is this idea of individuality versus collectivism, which is, which is a topic that is um, very often, you know, living at a centralized point in this discussion about Western systems and um, and non-Western systems, um, because the individual has such an important place in Western philosophy um, and sort of the hierarchies that come with um, individuality. So I think there's a lot to unpack there, um, you know, within the premise of that. And uh, I guess I would just say that it really from, from my perspective, you know, that's how we survive. We survived the apocalypse of colonization by adhering to our cultural values. And so that's not nothing, you know, that's significant. Uh, Aaron, thank you very much for your talk and for being so generous with your time and answering our questions. I know there are more, but um, Maybe that's a, if, if that seems like a good place to, um, to end tonight, or um, uh, I also want to thank you for inaugurating our um, fall series this year. Um, so, and, and, and you all have been, uh, uh, it's been great to have all of the participants here. So again, um, we're, we're really pleased to have you. Thank you so much, Max, and thank you to everybody for being here. I wish you all of the best in your artistic endeavors, 
And it's really just been an honor. Um, please reach out if there's anything that I can do in the future for you. Excellent. Well, we, we look forward to seeing more of your work out there. Thank you. Thank you so much. Okay. Good night. Good night. Thank you.